TSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. Did you ever wonder what Bill Gardner, the mechanic, does when he's not on Motoring 95? What is this? Bill's gym. Seriously, you need some help? Brad, I'd rather commit suicide than ask you for help on a car. Come on. I asked, didn't I? Anyway, we're here at the shop this week to get the lowdown on rotors. And of course, your rotor is very much like the wheel on your bicycle, and the calipers, of course, are the brakes. So a very important component on anyone's vehicle. Well, this week, we're going to begin by looking at the manufacturing of rotors, and we'll quickly discover that not all rotors are made alike. Since 1979, IPI has been in the business of producing brake rotors and drums. Along with its sister company in Chicago, IPI's total annual production is close to 11 million. Although only 10% are earmarked for the Canadian market, the raw materials are 100% Canadian. We buy our casting from uh, Sudbury, as a matter of fact. Uh, we buy some from a facility in Quebec that go through various machining operations from rough turning through to uh, CNC type drilling through uh, uh, final cut finishing, balancing, and uh, dipping for uh, protection against rust. We make a combination of many type rotors from imports uh, to your imported cars like Honda, Toyota, etc. to domestics, uh, uh, for instance, GM, Canadian, Ford. Um, we make large heavy duties for uh, trucks up, up to and including one-ton trucks. All our production from both our facilities is run to uh, strictly to OE specifications, that's original equipment manufacturers. Uh, during normal production, one in every ten rotors gets checked all dimensions. Uh, what he's checking for here right now is the overall height of the brake surface and the mounting surface or the wheel surface. And as you can see, uh, very minimum, almost zero, maybe a half a thou on the mounting surface and the same on the brake surface. The tolerance is plus or minus three. From here now, uh, the rotor goes into uh, another check, which is for run out. What we do here basically is simulate how it would run on the car. As you can see, the run out is approximately one to one and a half thou. But the tolerance there is five thou. So we're well within the tolerance. That's uh, when, I, when I'm speaking of tolerance, as I mean to OE spec. The reason uh, for checking one in 10 rotors is uh, uh, Really, we never ever have more than nine pieces bad at any given time. What that does is it enables us to immediately stop the line and, and go down the number of rotors required until we find it, which is never more than nine. Uh, so the risk of a product getting out the door that's off spec is very, very, very minimum, uh, almost non-existent. But not all brake rotors are alike, and a major American brake manufacturer has launched a campaign to inform consumers of that fact. The rotors in question are produced offshore, are cheaper priced than domestic, and are available in Canada. The brake rotor is an integral part of the braking system and basically has been designed to dissipate the heat. Unlike uh, no-name brand products you could buy at the supermarket, there are, there are no-name brand brake parts. And, uh, they don't always conform to certain specifications. Some of the product that is on the market doesn't meet certain iron and steel specifications and consequently will not dissipate the heat evenly. It will be very porous, it will rust early. You may find that due to its material composition, it's not dissipating the heat like it should. It may be retaining heat. That can be detrimental on the friction product, so you'll be in for pad replacement. Uh, it'll be detrimental to the seals of the caliper so you'll have to have your calipers overhauled or replaced. Uh, you'll start boiling the brake fluid. In the end, you're going to end up paying more for the brake job or paying more often for brake jobs for various reasons and without any real uh, answers as to why. I would never suggest that you buy uh, some of the cheap 
imitations that's coming out of uh, offshore. Uh, they may look the same, uh, they may look as good, but uh, believe me, they're not. There's, there's problems that uh, the average user or the average jobber don't realize that, that can and does exist. Uh, uh, it can create problems such as uh, improper braking, uh, overheating of the rotor can cause the rotor to explode. By not having those specifications, by, by not meeting certain criteria, they are, yes, able to produce a cheaper product uh, and uh, flood the market with maybe 10 or 12 of the top moving part numbers for the basic vehicles on the road and uh, offer a, a cheaper product. Definitely buy North American made product. Uh, it's run strictly to OE spec. Uh, I know ours is. And uh, it's a better product. It, uh, it might cost you a little more, but uh, in the long run, you'll come out miles ahead. I don't use offshore brake rotors in my shop, never have, probably never will. But I'll tell you something, they've benefited you, the consumer, in a big way. And I'll tell you about that a bit later. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This is Lincoln's latest, the all-new Continental. Now, this vehicle is going to redefine the term personal luxury sedan. Now, where better to test a Lincoln than the ritzy neighborhoods in and around Carmel, California? Power for the Continental is supplied by a new 4.6 liter 4 cam 32 valve V8 dubbed the Intec engine. Power is rated at 260 horsepower and 265 pounds feet of torque. With a 62% increase in power over last year's model, performance has taken a quantum leap forward. Acceleration off the line is brisk, building quickly as the engine starts to come fully on cam. The mid-range performance is quite simply outstanding. In the race to the 100k mark, the Continental required just 8.5 seconds. Not too shabby at all, especially given that this is a luxury automobile. Matched with this engine is a new electronically controlled four-speed automatic transaction that employs synchronous shifting. The idea being that a special clutch plate makes the gears shift when the computer asks for the next gear. The end result eliminates the need to time two separate clutches when changing between gears. During my time with the car, this transmission was the one weak point. The shifts are abrupt under hard acceleration, and at times the engine and transmission do not seem to be on the same page. While nothing to get worked up over, it needs attention. One of the really neat technical bits of this Lincoln Continental is something called the Memory Profile System. This system enables you to set 12 different things to your own personal specifications. They range from the seats to the mirrors, from the power steering to the suspension, right the way through to the radio and all 16 presets. And yes, the radio is returned to normal volume. So if your son was out the night before, you don't have to worry about being deafened by a dose of Nirvana. By the way, this level of sophistication is a world first. The suspension is comprised of McPherson struts up front and a double wishbone design in back, anti-roll bars at both ends and air springs at all four corners. The entire system is semi-active. At 100 kilometers an hour, the system monitors the suspension movement every six inches the car travels and adjusts the shock valving to afford the appropriate damping. On top of this, the memory profile system allows the driver to choose one of three settings, plush, normal or firm. Firm is the best setting because it offers good handling characteristics and a ride that is both compliant and comfortable. The driver adjustable power steering is, on the other hand, more of a toy than a real benefit. The best setting, and in my view the only one needed, is normal. In this setting, the on-center feel and feedback are better than average. Stopping power is supplied by a four-wheel disc brake setup that comes complete with a four-channel anti-lock system. During the brake test, this very competent system hauled this heavy car to a halt in just 119 feet from 80K. Impressive, to say the least. Tied in with the ABS is an all-speed traction control system that limits wheel spin by both reducing engine power as well as applying the brake to the offending wheel. The antenna for the radio is embedded in the back glass of this Continental. 
The reason it was done was to prevent damage to the antenna during a car wash. However, what they did forget, the antenna for the optional car phone. So if you do go with the car phone, don't forget about the antenna. The trunk, well, it's been very well laid out. They've put in this nice sliding basket here. You load this up, slide it back, finish loading the trunk. When you get to your destination, unload, slide it forward. That eliminates all of the back-breaking work trying to reach anything that's slid up against the back seats. In short, they've done a bang-up job with the trunk on this Continental. Inside, the rework of the interior is nothing short of spectacular. Start with the virtual image instrument cluster. This cluster offers a 3D image where the pointers seem to float in front of the analog dials. Simply stated, it is the best set of gauges in the industry. The radio, which now sits in the right place, and that is above the climate controls, now features a real knob for volume and large preset buttons that can be operated with gloves on. Up front, the seats are power operated, heated, and feature a pneumatic lumbar cushion. The comfort and support offered are excellent and are easily the best offered in the Ford range. In the back, the rear seat offers above average comfort and plenty of head and leg room. On the safety front, the new Continental fares very well offering ABS, traction control and dual airbags, as well as adjustable upper seat belt anchors and child-proof rear door locks. Well, that's it for this edition of Test Drive. Now, while I must admit that the Continental is not really my cup of tea, I must say that Ford have done a very good job in redesigning this new vehicle. First of all, the V8 engine gives it the power that it's always deserved. The memory profile system, which is an industry first, is sure to be a hit with the young or old. And you know, the other thing that I really liked about the vehicle, it now has the credentials to run up against the Cadillac Seville and Lexus LS400, its two key competitors. These are two 1995 Subaru Legacies, the wagon and the sedan. Now the wagon comes with full-time all-wheel drive. The sedan is front-wheel drive, but comes with traction control that can be turned on or off. Now, both systems are designed for better traction, especially in the winter months. But how do they compare? Well, on some upcoming programs, we're going to conduct some tests over unfriendly surfaces to try and find some answers. But now, let's head back to the garage where Bill Gardner is standing by. And Bill, earlier in the program, we had a look at brake rotors, and we found that the offshore brake rotors may come at a cheaper price but they can also come with inferior quality. What are your thoughts on this? Well, Brad, my dad used to have a saying, he used to say the best is none too good. And believe me, that statement really rings true in the car service business. You get yourself in enough hot water using the best quality repair parts. So we don't see any reason to use that offshore stuff. But believe me, I'm kind of glad that those guys are there selling that junk because it's driven the price of the good stuff down to the point where uh, the consumer's saving a lot of money and, and it's, you know, it's, it's uh, allowed us to do some jobs at more competitive prices. Uh, however, there's a couple things I do want to mention this week, and that's the fact that I notice altogether too many mechanics resurfacing brake rotors in the name of doing a better job. They automatically do it on every brake job, and that's the wrong thing to do. Now, there are many cases, many reasons why you do have to resurface brake rotors. If the car comes in with a severe shimmy or shutter, it's a good chance that it could be in the brake rotors. But there's other things that can cause it too. I mentioned that a few weeks ago on this show and those things should be investigated. Now, if you find that the brake rotor has a, a, an excellent finish on it, and you mic it all the way around and find that there's no thickness variation or run out, et cetera, you don't have to turn it. In fact, you're better not to turn it because every time you remove material from that brake rotor, you're making it a little bit weaker and it becomes a, a less effective heat sink. And the rotor is an, a very important heat sink. It absorbs a lot of heat and dissipates it from your brake system. That's what this finned area in the middle is intended to do. Now, if that finned area becomes heavily bunged with rust, that's another thing that would, could cause you to want to replace those brake rotors because you won't get good brake performance. For example, if you're driving in mountainous terrain or stopping a heavy trailer, you could have uh, a complete uh, pedal fade and uh, loss of, of braking effectiveness if your brake rotors are severely bunged with rust. So these are some of the things that could cause you to want to replace them. But believe me, don't just automatically resurface every brake rotor that comes in. If the car stops smooth and straight and you've got a bit of a squeal or a low pedal, maybe you just need new pads and that's really all you should be doing. Now, of course, this is something you have to leave up to the discretion of your mechanics, so you should have somebody that you can trust. By the way, you know we're talking about pads and brake rotors? I haven't checked Stella's pads lately. Hey, Stella, you're getting down on these front pads here. They're a little bit dirty, too. You better take a bath. 
Oh, the wear indicators haven't touched yet. You're okay. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 95. Pull into a gas station these days and you'll find more than gasoline being offered. Alternative fuels have become a reality. Recently, the Canadian magazine, World of Wheels, completed a long-term test on a Chrysler natural gas fan. During the six-month test, the magazine amassed 15,000 kilometers. Transport Canada conducted fuel emission tests, including cold weather testing. Natural gas vehicles are uh, very popular uh, with fleet businesses and so on, but we were interested in this one because it's the first natural gas vehicle being based on a minivan that has potential for um, a wider audience, for, for the general motorist to use it. The, the fairest assessment in the end is to say that we, we were frustrated because we were hugely impressed with the uh, environmental benefits of natural gas. Um, in the testing at Transport Canada, it met all foreseeable um, ULEV standards and so on by very, very comfortably. Um, even yeah, and it was vastly better than its gasoline equivalent, which itself met the standards very easily. Um, the, but there are two big obstacles. One is that the vehicle is still very expensive. Uh, the NGV package uh, adds about five and a half thousand dollars, and the other is uh, the effective range is about 200 kilometers. Uh, the there are not enough refueling stations, and uh, if you do run out of gas, gas in one of these things, it's not like running out of out of gasoline where somebody can bring along a five litre can and top you up again. Basically your only resort is to uh, get a tow. The natural gas industry would, would say that the one way that the um, government could start is by using more of these vehicles themselves. Um, the government preaches a lot about alternative fuels and the environment and so on, but they buy very few of these vehicles. If they did that, you know, it's one of these things if you if you start to get the production volumes and the prices can come down and then when the prices come down more people are likely to buy them and so on. The natural gas industry till, still tends to say at the moment that we're just a niche industry, we're looking after the fleet users, we're not interested in the wider market. But I, we believe that's a mistake because fi eventually these, all these fleet vehicles have to be resold, otherwise they're worthless. And uh, if, there aren't, if there isn't a wider market to buy the used vehicles, then you know, they're going nowhere. The Midas tip of the week concerns tailpipes, or in the case of this van, lack thereof. We all know that in the winter time, it's common for us to do a little bit more idling to warm the engine, defrost the windows, maybe we're running the heater to keep the interior a little bit warmer. In any case, those are conditions where an incomplete exhaust system like we have on this van could be an extremely hazardous situation. Fumes could easily enter the vehicle, and uh, we all know how dangerous that can be. And in the case of this van, the front half of the exhaust system was still in good shape, so it didn't get noisy when that tailpipe fell off. That's a thing you could easily overlook. A visual inspection will take care of it. That's your Midas Tip of the Week. Off-Road Corner with Cam McRae. Brought to you by Land Rover. Makers of Range Rover, Discovery, and Defender. When folks ask me to list the most important equipment for use off-road, I tell them just two things, a good set of tires and a good winch. Those tires will help keep you from getting stuck, but if the inevitable happens, a good winch will tow you out of there in the easiest possible fashion. Today we're going to show you how to practice using that winch before you end up out in the mud up to your knees. All you need is a level piece of ground and two vehicles, one equipped with a winch. First we're going to block the tires so the winch vehicle doesn't move. And then we're going to plug in the remote control. Then we activate the control and pay out a lot of cable and hook onto the towed vehicle. Operate the winch standing way off to the side of the vehicles. These cables are strong, they don't break often, but just in case. As the tension comes up in the cable, drop a coat or an old tire over it put some tension on it just in case the cable breaks you want to keep it nice and low. If you're alone and have to operate the winch from inside the vehicle, lift the hood. Again, more protection just in case the cable breaks. If you're not using your winch to haul somebody else out, it means you're stuck and a tree could be your best friend. Your Land Rover Canada Tread Lightly Tip of the Week don't wrap the winch cable around the tree. It'll kill it. 
If you're going to hug a tree, use a proper tree strap. For the Off-Road Corner, I'm Cam McCray. $65,000 difference in price between these two cars, yet they share one important high-tech safety advantage. Next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. These two cars don't have very much in common, but they do both have anti-lock brakes. They're standard on that $75,000 Lexus. They're an option on this $10,000 Geo Metro. Now, most experts agree ABS is the most important safety innovation since the radial tire. And yet the statistical support for this notion is so far not very strong. One U.S. study suggests ABS has no impact on crash frequency at all. This report from British Columbia suggests a small but not very significant advantage. The difference may be that in B.C. it rains more than in most places, and the advantages of ABS are most apparent in wet weather. Still, how come ABS hasn't helped us more? Well, some ABS critics say that cars with ABS are driven faster and thereby the drivers use up the safety cushion. Well, that's nonsense. If that logic were true, we'd go back to bias ply tires and not bother with seat belts. Still, the most important reason, I think, is that ABS is a new technology. Many drivers simply don't know how to use it properly. Some drivers are scared by the brake pedal vibration and the noise, and one study suggests that in almost half of all crashes, drivers don't put the brakes on at all. Now, this all points to an old theme of mine, driver training. Get ABS in your next car, and then get a course that teaches you how to use it. Also, a course that'll teach you to look far enough down the road so you'll know enough to put the brakes on in the first place. Now, if the car you're looking at doesn't offer ABS, First, berate the salesman and the car company, and then go shop somewhere else. If GM can make it available on a cheap car like this, there's no excuse for anybody else. And if it comes down to a toss-up between ABS and an airbag, well, ABS, to me, is a much better safety value. On average, an airbag will only explode every 175 years. If you're properly belted as a driver, it'll only give you 6% more safety survivability in that crash. There's virtually no advantage for the passenger and none at all for rear seat riders. ABS, on the other hand, will help prevent injuries to every occupant of the car. Hey, if it only prevents one fender bender, it's more than worth it. I'm Jim Kenzie. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be taking our two legacies out into a winter wonderland for some exciting tests on a future program, so make sure you join us. And make sure you join us next week as we present our annual Car of the Year special as we determine the best of the class of 95. That's next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 95 is proud to introduce the first in a series of comprehensive test drive videos with an exclusive comparison of the seven most popular minivans in North America. Graham Fletcher evaluates performance, versatility and safety. Bill Gardner examines each van, top to bottom, front to back and under the hood. Jim Kenzie covers showroom savvy, the demonstrator, buying or leasing, options, and much more. We'll also compare fuel economy, safety features, warranties, replacing parts, and recall history. For your copy of this exclusive comparison video, send check or money order to Motoring 95, P.O. Box 65213, Toronto, Ontario, M4K3Z2, or call 1-800-340-7607. 416 and 905 area codes call 416-462-1504. TSN's Motoring 95 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension and steering service, trust your car to Midas.